continued from the Thaddeus story so far. He said he would show me the stars. He said he would show me splendor my mind could barely comprehend. And here, in this one place alone, he has made good on all of his promises, because the last weeks have been spent in a place of wonder, a region I had oft heard of, but had never dreamed I would actually visit. Yet our months on ships, once defending ourselves from a ludicrously inept attempt on our lives, has paid off, and we finally arrived. The Five Hundred Worlds, the jewel in the Imperium's crown, the birthplace of legends, Ultima, McCrag. And it has been an experience I would not have passed up for all of the credits in the galaxy. For here, I finally see my master's defenses lower. His shoulders do not hold their perpetual tightness. His gait is wide, his smile's broader. He does not say it, would never admit to it, I had thought. But it was unmistakable. Thaddeus had returned home. I was shocked from the first second of our arrival, the moments after our breaching warp space into real at the Mandeville point. A special guest of the captain, which I can only imagine was orchestrated by my master, we were on the bridge when we translated into real space. And it was only seconds later that near every screen or display on our humble passage liner was screeching the danger we were in. So many target locks on us. So many celestial bodies all circled with enormous defenses, fortresses, defense flotillas, monitors, mines, and many a contraption that would make my head spin to even attempt to describe. We were the center of attention for the merest moment, yet it did not ruffle a single feather amongst the many crew on the bridge. This was normal. Thaddeus simply chuckled as he was watching my reaction, always watching me whenever I was distracted, always when something unexpected or amazing was happening. I no longer paid it any mind. Of course he would watch me. In me are all of the hopes of his line contained, so he keeps telling me. No pressure. That I would be chosen to be the last in a line of ninety-nine Inquisitors, stretching all of the way back to the first centuries of the Orders of the Inquisition. Nope. No pressure at all, then. But I digress. Access protocols were swiftly beamed across, and one by one the target locks dropped off. Well, most of them. The huge space stations retained passive locks for the full duration of our lengthy docking process. The void was filled with ships going to and from the planet's surfaces all across the system. Huge queues of them outside of the docking areas, lines moving perpetually despite their size. Efficient. Organized. Thorough. Everything done in its correct time and place, with no delays that could be managed better. But with this amount of traffic, it was impossible for anything to move swiftly. So we all reposed to our quarters and packed. After that bracing five minutes, as I literally have about five things to my name, I cooled my heels and read about the place I was about to visit. An amazing place. An ancient place. A realm that had endured even throughout old night. The landing place of the Lord Commander himself, Reboot Gilliman. The stories went on and on. I barely scratched the surface before being summoned by my master as we all processed to the disembarkation deck. And there he was, my master. Chatting away with Ursula, Deverin and Barbon. Deverin and Barbon chortled at points. Ursula was coy as ever she is when so close to Barbon. But even she was beaming, and wow. Ursula was looking fine indeed, dressed in some of the most delicate and complicated lace I had ever witnessed. She seemed like a princess from some picked cast, and of course she was gorgeous. But then, isn't the off-limits always more alluring? Astadius always likes to whisper into my ear whenever he catches me casually perusing her. He seems less worried when she gives me that look, 
the one that says if I arrive at her apartments after dark, I would not be the same coming out in the morning, not by a long chalk. She has clocked me, I can tell. She throws her hair across her shoulders in a graceful flick, showing me her neck, slightly more tilt in her hips. It's instinctive, of course. As stated previously, Thaddeus has taught me all about body language. I wandered up, as usual, and their demeanor shifted ever so slightly. Barbon looks at me utterly blankly, like he does to Ursula sometimes. <sighs> I can never tell if he wants to end me there and then, or wants to protect me from the worst the galaxy has to throw at me. Perhaps it is both. He is Astartes. He is intelligent. He, like most humans, is a huge kaleidoscopic collection of mixed emotions, warring drivers. But he has given his oath. He serves the Thaddeus. I can only hope that this remains the same for a long period yet. I do not think I have the love of Barbon. He clearly is capable of the emotion. His eyes positively scream his affection when he looks at Devlin or Thaddeus. But not me. Not yet. Hopefully, I have time to win him over. Devlin's expression shifts from convivial joviality to a sly, mischievous look. I don't need to be a psyker to tell he is at this very moment planning his next jape at my expense. But then, as he said once himself, best get his licks in before I get an upgrade. How he could make light of the death of someone he clearly worships, my master Thaddeus, is quite beyond me. But then, I have never been a guardsman. I hear that their humor is as black as it gets and features gallows more often than not. And his licks he certainly did get in. A <laughs> plenty. From finding my left power-armored boot to be his new urinal onwards. It's always the left boot. A running joke now, of course. When not a urinal, the left boot often goes missing whenever Thaddeus gives me permission to have but one night of good honest sleep and allows me to take it off. But this is rare, of course. The components of this particular suit of power armor are complex, but the basic upshot is that they protect both me and those around me. It has a psychic hood, you see. Only recently come into my powers, I am still considered somewhat of a threat to them and to myself, because I have a connection to the Immaterium, the Warp, and thus the dark denizens that reside in that place. Devrin has also been tasked to make my existence to be rather unpredictable. My master again, of course. Devrin took to enjoying his role like a fowl to water, an elder eye to wine. I find most mornings that I am attacked, shot at, have to watch every darn thing in my apartments, and on the ways to anywhere I had been going on ship. My realization of the nature of the lessons began when I was walking past two security officers on the ship. I'd just made it round the corner from them when he struck for the first time. He wrapped a long, thin wooden pole around the left side of my head, the side with the reinforced metal augmetics. It did zero to the structural integrity of the augmetics in my skull because of them, but it left my head ringing as he then reached around my head and brought it down hard on his knee. An explosion of technicolor dots spattered my vision as he then pushed me to the ground, my balance shot by a thunderous impact. While receiving a totally unsolicited shoeing, in which I later found out I had lost the integrity of four ribs, the security guards made it back to us on the double. For one instance, the guards stopped and reached for their sidearms, Devlin just beamed at them, giving me a few fleeting seconds of respite as he chirpily instructed them to discuss the situation with the captain. They stepped back and used a vox to contact the bridge. Their eyebrows went up as they both nodded to Devlin and were about to walk away. It seems that in my confusion and attempt to gain my footing, Devlin must have given them some sort of gestured invitation as both then very helpfully kicked out the arm that was supporting me, then joined in the fun with a real verve. After I was beaten to near unconsciousness, they stopped, 
the guards chortled and confirmed to a jubilant Devlin that they could help him out with his hobby any time he liked. And so it went on. Devrim would not only perform his jobs, but, as I found out, he was on strict instructions to make me ready for anything, at any time. I did mention this to my master, of course. Master? <laughs> yeah? Devrim? Oh, yes! <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's my doing. I feel that you may have the temptation to do a lot of navel-gazing. You know, disappear up your own warp bottom and end up farting out self-serving platitudes about your connection to infinity. Devrin, being the good lad that he is, has agreed to make sure you keep your eyes on the prize, your feet firmly on the ground and your wits and guards high. He tells me you are really improving. If you keep up this sort of stellar progress, I shall have to ask Barbara to help out. Oh, right. Um, so, how long does this go on for? Well, I can't go telling you right out like that, can I? I mean, all of Devrin's fun aside, if I reveal that, then you'll only raise your guard to then lower it when you think this test is over. Ah, yes, I, I, I see the logic. Oh, wonderful. I'm so glad I have your seal of approval. <laughs> and boy... Yes, Master? Although you are indeed making good progress, I am a little bit doofed, to be honest. That's over a score of times he could have killed you in the last two weeks alone. Do better, and do it fast. Or I'll start sending not only Barbar, but Ursula too. You are Ordomalius. Get it together. And that was that. I spent my days on the ship perpetually looking out for Devrin. The ingenuity and sheer patience he would display were astounding. Especially that time he spent two whole days in my closet. The only thing that actually made me approach it was a, well, a strong whiff of we. Alas, thinking it another jape, I opened the door to find out which of my few garments had been marked, only to receive another very swift thrashing. The door swung open wide, as I have to admit I was a bit knocked, and he was straight into me. A knuckle punched to the throat, and I was gasping for air and doubled over. The usual happened, and I was reacquainted with his footwear and the zeal that moved them. He tends not to like punching me in the face anymore, due to my hardened skull. So these days he is well aware that I will be using my face to block and hurt his knuckles. So, the kicking... Always the kicking. But I am faster now. I am more aware, even than I was before. It is certainly working. I now scan every room before I enter it, before the door chime has even been used. I may not be anything even near incompetent with my new abilities, but this I can do. She taught me how to read minds, but advised against it. So surface activity only. But that is more than enough to now tell if Devlin is waiting in ambush. Well, most of the time. Devlin himself may be no scholar, but for a grunt, he is deft enough. Smart enough to turn my advantages against me. The constant game of cat and mouse that is never, ever over has indeed made me more mentally and physically responsive. So I've hardly been bored during our trip, I can tell you. But that was then, and this is now. From that meeting on the disembarkation bay, we took a shuttle down. A small but sleek affair. But oh, how I enjoyed the views as we made our way to the planet. The industry was immediately apparent. The cargo haulers. The myriad of ships going up and down, loading and unloading. Yet the world was not a barren ball of cloying smog. For the air was clean and clear. The sky full of brilliant warm sunlight and fluffy white clouds that languidly glided across the scenes all the time we were there. The wonder of it all. Ultramar. McCrag itself. 
I have basked in the vision of the Crown Mountains, both from their base and from their peaks. I have walked the stairs and then inside to witness the shrine of the Primarch, where Abut Gilliman sat for ten millennia or more. I have visited the Library of Ptolemy, the greatest repository of wisdom I have ever witnessed. I could spend ten lifetimes in there, not even scratch the depths of knowledge therein contained. I have walked the fortress of Hera, seen wonders there of another sort. All of it was breathtaking. I simply cannot describe it all, any of it really. It may be something I wrestle with for all of my days, the best way to encapsulate this place, this haven, this beacon of light in a galaxy of darkness. But I simply do not have the words, the craft. And as we are on the fortress of Hera, I really should mention what happened there. For it seems that I am not the only one who is to be recharged and retrained here. Barbon has certainly made a splash. I cannot quite put my finger on when it happened, but Barbon has changed. He just seems... more. Again, Malak of skill and description does not help here. It is like he has had fetters removed from him, like he is more free somehow, yet even more gnarly if I am honest. But as always, Thaddeus has found an avenue for his tension, a release for his energies. And it happened when we went to the fortress of Hera, the very home of what are inarguably the greatest space marines of all time, of any bloodline, the Ultramarines. An odd day to say the least, but far more normal after that initial shock. For when we arrived at the fortress, it was not to some queue, not to wander around like tourists, no. For it seems that here in this hallowed place, my master is well respected indeed. Met by an honor guard of no less than 20 ultramarines. And their leader was a living legend. Not that it had any impact on my master, of course. The Space Marine was wearing armor very similar to my own, a psychic hood. As we approached him, ten marines on either side of us, he walked down the stairs and came to meet with us. A psyker. Possibly the most powerful psyker in the Astartes, they say. He eyed me up for a moment before locking his gaze on a beaming Thaddeus. Tiggy! It's been decades! How are you? I really wish you wouldn't call me that in front of the men. It's unbecoming, Thaddeus. Well, a wager is a wager, old fruit. You should never bet if you can't afford to lose, eh, Tiggy? That was a long time ago, Thaddeus. A long time ago. That it was, Tiggy! So what brings one of McCrag's most illuminous sons to the halls of Hera? Deck collecting, actually. Why am I getting the feeling that this will be annoying? Oh, don't be such a stick in the mud. I've seen you off your trolley on Fenris here, young man. Spiking my drink was playing with fire. I should have slain you there and then. Oh, well, spilt milk, missed opportunities. Now, let's save us both some precious time. Here is what I want. Do tell. Firstly... I need some sparring practice. I'll need your best. You think yourself up to fighting a Astartes, little man? Oh, for the throne state, drop the pompous act. Like I'm that stupid. It's for my aide here, Barbon. You bet, Barbon. He needs to get his hands dirty. I'm taking him into some very nasty waters soon, and I need him tip-top. So we'll need a regime. I shall speak to the Master of the Watch. The regime will start tomorrow at dawn. Wonderful. Now, we need to chat privately for the second thing. Of course that is. And at that they left. Barbon, Devrin, Ursula and I were then given the kind of tour that even high nobility would never witness. We were with Thaddeus, so we were treated like kings. Like kings, I tell you. No question was too small or irrelevant. No query unanswered. I had the time of my life discussing the history, architecture, materials, all of it. Of course, 
The other three were less pleased with my perpetual barrage of queries, but they knew full well that we would be doing this until the master had finished in his little discussion with Tigurius, chief librarian of the Ultramarines. It was hours, but I was enjoying myself, so the time flew. Well, for me anyway. When Thanius returned, he had a deeply stern-looking chief librarian in tow, scowling so hard he had a monobrow. The chief librarian looked me over and just nodded at Thaddeus, then turned on his heel and walked away, barking over his shoulder. Baba, arrive at dawn. Bring your weapons and armor. And so we left again. We hit a night attraction and joined the local populace in their revels. Loud music, sweaty bodies all crammed in, and Amasic flowing like water. Ursula was dazzling, and her stint on the dance floor gave her the choice of shore leave partners, I can tell you. Even I was hit on more times than I could count. Then, after a much-needed visit to the restroom, I practically had to double-take when I found Thaddeus regaling a score of beautiful young things with tales of his exploits. By the throne, he could have taken someone home that night too if he had the mind for it. Babon was not present. He was shooed to bed before we even went out. By Thaddeus of all people. Right, you'll need your rest for tomorrow, Babon. The avenging sons men do not ask for nor give quarter. I'm sworn to defend you, old man. Here? Are you nuts? Stop making excuses. It's not like the Amasek will touch your enhanced constitution anyway. And you're not exactly going on the pull either, you Nancy. Fine. But if you snuff it out there in some barroom brawl, I have witnesses that you sent me off. Do what? Does anyone look like they're in the mood for a scrap here? Howdy throne, stop being petulant. I know you're excited, but the faster you go to bed, the faster you get to play with the boys in blue. Show your stuff. Anyway, Deverin is going with us. And I'm not dead yet, not nearly. So sod off to bed, will you? A tart and an eye rolling later, and Barbon was off. But he had a spring in his step like I'd never seen before. Thaddeus, no matter how offensively put, was absolutely spot on. Barbon was as close to glowing as a Black Templar can get, without their faces shattering. But how did I end up in a nocturnal drinking den without my armour? without the constraint that Thaddeus stated for months was a protection from the denizens of the warp. <sighs> he gave me a drink. A drink, he said, would negate my abilities, but in a far less dramatic or traumatizing way than the grenade. And it did. Because I had warning, because it was slow in its effect, I was not panicked or fearful when my connection to the warp was somehow shut down. Ursula did not partake of this special brew. She had control of herself, so it was just me. And for the first time in months, my mind was calm. I say my mind, as I am mostly calm, but it is not. The constant buzz of other thoughts in the background, increasing in volume whenever I concentrate, but the background buzz is always there. But tonight, it was not. Not any longer. But I did not drink too much Amasek, nor did I do any dancing, much as I wanted to. And I knew why. Devlin. His attacks. I was aware of how vulnerable we were, even in the midst of this huge congregation of our fellow humans. We were always vulnerable. So I had a few drinks, watched Ursula, of course. I have eyes in a heartbeat. But my attention wandered endlessly. I watched Devlin, my master, the exits and entrances, the upper walkways, the doors for the drink receptacle collectors to move in and out of the club, the stewards who provided the drinks, the tall and broad security guards who would not seem out of place in Arbiter's back armor, the endless crowds perpetually looking for anyone watching any of our troop and making a line for them. Everyone. All of them. I could not turn it off. I also did not wish to. I was aware, and I liked it. 
I liked it a lot more than the feeling of drunk euphoria and false courage. I did not get in any shore leave, but then I took heart from the vision of old Thaddeus with all those gawping young bodies around him, hanging on his every word. I had time for that sort of thing. I had time. And so, our days progressed ever more oddly with each one that passed. For Devrin did not ambush me for two whole weeks, as he was sent off on a matter of import by Thaddeus. Something about gaining more hands on deck was all I could get out of him. And Barbar was all the rage. He'd begun his training well, and now was the talk of the Marines. One after another of them had been matched against him, and each time he had come out on top. I heard tales of a true rarity, though. Not from Barbar, of course, but from my master. He bounded into our main dining area, clearly hunting for me. He was chortling so hard that he could barely breathe, water leaking from his eyes at the mirth of it. But when he showed me the picked viewer, I found nothing there to laugh at. Not one bit. For it was silent, thankfully. But the pics were vivid and very explanatory. Someone had been watching Barbon smash his latest adversary with ease when the entire room erupted into a cacophony. Well, I would imagine. As I said, there was no sound. But the Marines all jumped up into lines and saluted, then went into a huge bout of cheering and slapping each other on the back as the Marine unclasped his cape and let it fall as he marched in. I had no idea who it was, but they were of high rank by their markings. It would seem that Barbon ripping through the Ultramarines was not to be taken lying down, and this Marine had come to teach the Black Templar a lesson. But the fight that ensued... Holy throne and he who sits on it. The duel was magnificent. They began in the dueling arena. The Ultramarine did not skip a beat as he walked down the stairs and unsheathed his blade while walking at Barbon. Not to, but at. He wasted no time in bowing ceremonially and then immediately dancing into a faultless string of over four dozen interconnected attacks. His blade moved so swiftly I could not make it out and Thaddeus slapped my hand away from the picked viewer when I went to slow it down. The old codger. An obvious cheer went up from the Ultramarines as Barbon was forced back. But when the Ultramarine finished his attacks and locked blades with Barbon, ground hard, and then took one step back, we knew that he had perhaps met his match. Perhaps. Barbon stood his ground and did not advance into the obvious lure. And then silence reigned and the watching marines were utterly motionless as they looked on. Barbon and this ultramarine hero were now circling each other and looking for advantage. Instead of slowing matters down, my master moved them forward so that an hour had passed. Still, the two were at it, but close and clashing, endlessly lunging, parrying, thrusting, sweeping, leaping, dodging. And so my master skipped forward again, still wheezing from the hilarity of my reactions. I was agog. The counter clarified that it had been moved forward five hours straight. Neither man had removed their helm, neither man had slowed, neither showed even the slightest sign of fatigue. And now it was not confined to the arena, for Barbar and the Ultramarine had fought each other outside into the courtyard. And all now looked down from every wall, hundreds of Marines and serfs all cheering on the two combatants. Thaddeus then turned off the recording, leaving me utterly hanging. My head twisted in his direction, I shot him a vicious glare. This, of course, made him double over in even greater guffaws of my consternation. Barbon literally has no idea who he just crossed swords with. None. They'll be talking about this for a hundred years, mark my words. Did he win? Oh, no! If you want to know what happened... You will have to somehow winkle it out of Barbar himself. <laughs> Good luck with that, boy. You bastard. Yep, and never forget it. <laughs> so Devrin was busy. Barbon was busy. But what of Ursula? Well, she went in to see her kind. Our kind, I should say, really. We dropped her off one morning outside a sumptuous building of imposing imperial construction. Beautiful but functional, 
as with all things on Ultramar, but certainly imposing. Thaddeus informed me she would be there for a while. He sighed long muttered about a test of her frame of mind and purity, but would not be drawn on the matter. And so, the two of us were finally alone again. It had been some time now. Of course, there was always the training, the sessions of question and answer, tests of memory, perception, but these were work. It had been a long time since we had spent any time together without the structure. And it was silence. But the strangest of silences. Before, it might have been pregnant with anticipation, me waiting permission to grill him about the last activities, the events of the day and his choices. But this was different. As we moved through the air in our conveyance, we both idly looked out. I was wide-eyed still at the splendor of it all. When I caught a reflection of Thaddeus, he was almost misty-eyed. He held a content, quiet look on his face, but he looked every second of his three hundred-plus years there beneath the light from the star of his birth. It unveiled him a bit more, but despite the lines that were clear evidence of the deeds that haunted him, he did not look frail, not to me. He looked worn, but not worn out. The quiet satisfaction he had as he looked down around, slowly surveying his world like it was his kingdom. And he started to tell me about it, quietly at first, never with the animation I know him to be capable of. This was reserved, private. He tells me all he knows about each area we traverse, we pass. An inquisitor of his ability, he can transfer so much information so concisely. He really is telling me everything he knows about this place. He never takes his eyes off the horizon and vista while he would travel, never shifts his gaze to me, merely points out what he is discussing, if it is required. And I knew it. There. That look on his face. This. This is his core. This is why he does it. This is how he can continue. He loves this world, his home, his Ultramar, his McCrag. And he knows he will die for it. I can see that now. Then I realize it. What does he know? What has he seen? I cannot help but break my gaze and look aside. I do not want to see this. I am not ready, for I know why we are here. Emperor, protect me. He is saying goodbye. The conveyance goes into land slowly and surely, and we are in the middle of what looks like nowhere a small patch of clearance in a forest, but not an old one anymore, he explains. It was mostly destroyed by the vile ones. The trees are not old, but they are verdant and lush and wide. Perhaps it is for the better, for young leaves allow more of the light to filter down in darts of yellow, like spotlights on the forest floor. We get out and the vessel takes off again. It will return on the morrow, and we enter the forest. We charge for what feels like hours. On occasion, Thaddeus will stop and simply sigh as he looks at where an older, different set of trees of significance to him once stood. We travel in silence. He in front, me behind. And I know I will never forget these moments. No matter how long or short my life may be, for we did not travel as master and apprentice. We did not need to fill the air with lectures and lessons, wisdoms revealed, regrets and loss. We traveled as two friends, 
on a sacred pilgrimage. For I worked out where we were going. It could be no other. It was his world, the world of the Thaddeus. Over sixty percent of them had come from here. He used to like to taunt me. But really, he was just displaying his one not-so-secret pride. He was a son of Macrag, as was the very first Thaddeus. So it made sense. It could only be here. For few think about it, none discuss it. The traditions are so rare now. My master told me, less than a score have passed their knowledge unbroken through the ages. So many slain by the enemy, so few remain. And they are now avoided, even by other Ordo's members, for the traditions are known to be despised by the enemy so much they will send entire armies to slay but one. And if they catch us, if they can predict where we will be, if they can bring us into traps, betrayals, as they have done so many times before. But this is met by the power, knowledge and experience of the traditions. For they are some of the most potent inquisitors in the service of the Imperium, certainly the most effective. And thus, they are hunted. Alas, the traditions became known to the denizens of the Dark City as well and more than a few have been taken by them over the time. But what does nobody think about, nobody discuss? Their resources. And I do not mean those that can be commandeered or commanded by the use of our seal, the authority granted to us by the Emperor. No. I mean their individual resources. Their troves. I had not considered it until we were walking, when he stopped before a mound, a large one, covered in greenery, fresh, alive, but new. He touched a device in his hand, one of ancient design, and before us the mound opened. We heard the many, many bars and locks untwirl as the doors then opened and we walked inside. As we passed the doors I noticed their depth. It was meters. Metal crossbars and pins that were attracted when it opened. It was more secure than any hard point in a capital ship. At that, Thaddeus turned to me and extended out his arm in an expansive gesture of welcome. As I walked in, he took a position behind me. I knew why. He wanted to see my reaction naturally. My first sight of it all. And he was right to. I will, if I ever have this moment to pass on, to reenact in my own time, I will do this. For he must have seen my feet slow, my pace shorten, watched me take it all in, as I looked on at the marvel he had saved for me. They had all saved for me. All of them. All ninety-nine of them. And it felt it was just for me. Inside was marble, beautiful and well lit. Images and shadows played off every surface, reflecting off columns. It was dazzling. I walked through the open door so slowly. I stopped after only three more paces. The area was expansive but filled. As stated, columns of white marble held up a ceiling that was like a morning fresco, the white clouds of Macag floating on its surface. But what was so amazing? The plinths, the... well, everything. On ninety-nine plinths were ninety-nine figures, each a different Thaddeus, each from a different era, but all wore the same armour. The armour Thaddeus wore now, I was certain of it. They were made of light, holograms of utter beauty, twisting slowly like vines in the breeze. All around them were smaller displays, that had light sculptures of such delicate, almost sublime perfection. And that was just the main hall. It was like the images of the Emperor waiting his flock. It was heaven, made real. I was staggered, dumbstruck, slack-jawed at the impossibility of the immensity and intensity of what this all was, what it meant to me. 
and Zavius slowly walked up until he was next to me and just beamed across. Nice, isn't it? Yes. Does it make more sense now? And I looked at each of my forebears, the beings they were, not the shining lights of myth, not the dusty shams many think of us all, we inquisitors. They were real, as real as Thaddeus was, as real as I am myself. And they had fought the same battle, waged the same war, unceasingly unbroken, for ten thousand years. Yes. Yes, it does, Master. No longer. What? You cannot call me that now. This marks the end. I spun on him, shocked. But you said I was the one. You said I would be the Thaddeus. You said I could do it. I had to do it. You've not failed, Tarkonis. <sighs> Today is the day you no longer call me Master. Today is the day you become my ally, my friend, my successor. You are not the Thaddeus, not yet. But after today, you will be an Inquisitor, and you will be my named successor. So it's time we discuss this place, what we really are, the traditions, all of it, what we've done, what we plan, what we are attempting to achieve, how we are to do it, and who will try to stop us. And then you will be nearly ready. Nearly. A few more years working together at least, eh? But you have worked. You have shown your mettle. You have fought. You have shown your skill. You have endured. You have shown your faith. Now all you need to do is learn one last thing. But the hardest thing of all. What? How to be wise. I only pray we have enough time. I'll do my best. You always do, Tarkonis. It's why this day has come at all. Because you try your best. You taught me well. I didn't teach you that, boy. Bravery. You had that before ever we met. So, Tigurius, you had him scare me, didn't you? Well, of course I did. I'm not an idiot. And Ursula is no telepath. So I passed the test? You're here, aren't you? I smile and nod. He again opens his hands expansively, and I take the invite and wander. We have all night. So he just hovers at my elbow, ready to answer questions about this or that member, this or that sculpture. We move from room to room as he shows me the literal piles of Archaeotech, wards, talismans, weapons, objects, and every other form of item one can imagine, all catalogued, all presented. He could outfit a small army with this lot. And then he shows me the book. His life's work. And when I say he, I mean the Thaddeus. All of them. It is then that we are interrupted by the resident Thaddeus never chose to mention until he leapt onto the scene. And as soon as I saw him, I realized that things are going to get very interesting indeed. Ultramar long gone. We are off across the galaxy again. A small ship booked up with the Ultramarines. It was ours now. Small, but it turned out to be quite heavily armed. And it was all ours. I had no idea why Thaddeus needed such a resource, but he would make me aware in his own time. He settled Barbon and Ursina, and then had a set of large crates brought on board. It did not take a genius to know that one of them had the Ruccaro, Louis, contained within. I had no understanding of the cloak and dagger in getting him on board, but assumed it was for the best. 
Thaddeus always knew what he was up to. Well, after technically raising me from his apprentice to his successor, I certainly expected him to explain things soon. But I trusted the crusty old man more than anyone, even myself. He had his reasons for his silence. So we got back into pattern. Training. Forever training. Whilst training with Barbon, we quizzed each other. Swords, of course. The old marine batted off my sallies and feints with contemptuous ease, both physically and verbally. He gave me a pasting. But then, the oddest thing happened. I saw the other side of Barbon, the one he will never show any but Thaddeus. He'd smashed my hand down and stepped past me again, smacking my buttocks mercilessly with the flat of his blade as he did. <sighs> it was getting to be a thing, this particular chastisement for sloppy swordsmanship. I could barely sit down some days, but I took advantage today. I was smarting from the last three butt smacks and did the unconscionable. I hit below the belt. As Barbon came at me again, I had worked out that all of his own off-putting questions had been obliquely about my master. No, I cannot call him that anymore. They were about Thaddeus, my friend. But the old marine must have noted something, spotted the change. He was deeply concerned about Thaddeus. That is all I could tell. So I took advantage. While he raised to attack again, I barked. He's shown me his lair! At this, Barbon falters just a split second. Got him, thinks I. Unthinkingly. He'd reacted. So I pushed the issue while I twisted my blade and struck at his head. He's shown me the book! And blow me. It worked. Barbon near froze. He just stopped and looked at me as my sword nearly bounced off his head, his instincts deflecting the blow at the very last second. Way too tight. He stepped back, gawping at me. I knew instantly I had made a tragic, tragic blunder. The marine's shoulders and arms sagged. He just looked like a ghost, all colour drained from his face. His sword tip dragged on the floor as his arms hung so low. He just gawped at me. His head tipped to the side as he looked at me and intoned. He explained the book. I gulped. He looked utterly lost. Yes. He took me to the lair, the trove. He showed me many things. But the last was the book. Oh, said Barbon. That explains everything, was all he mustered. He turned and walked away, straight to the showers. He did not say another word. I was stunned. I left it a while then followed him. And there he was, standing under the shower, a luxury beyond belief. But this was our ship, and it was from Ultramar. His shoulders taut, his arms resting against the wall above his head, which hung low, looking at the ground. Water poured over him, his face. His fists clenched and unclenched above his head. He looked so desolate. It is the only word I can think of to describe it. I left him to his quiet moment. I felt I was intruding on something deeply personal. Later that day, I witnessed a second event I never thought to see. I was going about my business, about to prepare a light snack, when I heard voices from a room. I knew them both. I stalked up, thinking Devlin might not be as distant as I believed, always now on guard. And it happened. Another first. For I saw Barbon and Ursula alone. And that never, ever happened. Look again. You might have been wrong. Look again, whispered Barbon, in a tone I had never heard from him, let alone addressing Ursula. I cannot, Barbon. You know this. Perhaps the boy has changed matters. That a Templar would ask this of me is beyond belief. 
A Templar I am I, but he is my friend. Do you hear me? Do you think I don't want things to be different? Don't you? Throne, Barbon. What do you take me for? No, don't answer that. He clenched his fists, restraining himself in every way possible. But Ursula did not step back. Her voice then broke. There is no point, Barbon. I did it when we first met Tarquinus. I looked. It changes nothing. Babon's fist unclenched again. I saw him sag. I could not help myself. I was young. I was foolish. I had barely begun to understand my powers, and my soul reached out of its own accord. And I see it. I feel it. My back stings and I feel blood rivulets spatter my skin. The lash. It strikes me again and again as I trudge. My back in tatters. I lose my footing and stumble to the side. The baying crowds there push me backwards and I fall to my knees. It hurts. Pelted with swill that runs into my ribboned back. It stings like boiling water being poured into bare flesh. I wince, but I stand. I push myself up. I hold my head high from here on in. The lash strikes again, but I do not falter. I take the hit and walk. Walk towards a huge pyre, wood stacked around the central pole. My hands bound, they swing in front of me. I do not even try to stop that which is being hurled at me. Rotten vegetables and spittle run down my face. But I walk with head held high. Towards the pyre. My pyre. I can see them standing around its edges. They all wear their formal robes. They all hold burning brands, ready for the main event. They've wanted this for so long. It seems a pity, but my job is done. I can reach peace now. My lord knows what I have done and not done. He knows the difference between that and the accusations others have made that have led me to this point. But he also knows the darkness I have done, the things I can never forgive myself for, never atone. And for a second I stop. I do not fear the flames. I do not fear the men with sharpened teeth or leering at me with their brands. I fear not that. But by the throne, I fear the judgment of he who sits on it. I did it all in his name, all of it. But now I wonder, did I do what he intended? Soon enough, I will find out. The vision swirls and disappears. My mind returns to the present as I hear the echoes of Ursula's cry, and a second later I feel Barbon's hand around my throat, lifting me up to his eye level. He is livid. I may not survive this. I vomit. He releases me and I land on my feet while he wipes his hands on my clothes as I double over and lose the rest of the contents of my stomach. It was the combination of it all. The fast dive, the vision, being snapped out of it by Barbon's action. Also, it may have saved my life. He only needs an excuse to drop me. One to reinitiate his thinking instead of fighting pattern. I vomited on him as a tactical maneuver, as much as a biological one. And it worked. Thank the throne. I blow out and snort to try to clear my mouth and nose of the last dribbles of puke. Barbon, again just turns on his heel and stomps away from me. I catch him thumbing at me while looking at Ursula, who is now very skittish again in front of Barbon. She nods, then walks towards me. She is not happy. Boy, if you ever desecrate my privacy again, I shall use my telekinesis to rip off your 21st digit and shove it down your throat, so there'll be no more sure leave for you ever again. Do I make 
myself clear. I agree, of course. She does not stay to hear my apology. I am then left with a puddle of vomit to clean up and a head full of fury. For if this is true, if this is how my master, the Thaddeus, ends, then there is no justice in the universe. None. The day gets worse, of course, as they have a tendency to do. Well, worse, a strong word. Perhaps stranger would be more appropriate, more descriptive. For the Jacaro, Louis, is finally out and about. Now to say that this is strange is an understatement, for I witnessed the awareness of Barbon to our new guest. Around the corner came the huge Astartes moving with calm purpose, an intersection of two tunnels. The two of them met as I walked towards them. Barbon sees the orange primate and then instantly took a combat pose, left foot forward, right back, hunched and ready to attack. And to my astonishment, the Xenos mop of orange fur mimicked his stance perfectly. Xenos! growled Barbon but not as a statement of species, but of recognition. The Jikero just copies him in some mad pantomime. Ooh, 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 ooh. Both then take one step closer and begin to growl at each other. <coughs> the marine larger than life, looking down at a being that seems to be mocking him with its almost mirrored movements of his own. Then a new player enters the fray, as my must... Sorry, Thaddeus does not even raise his eyes from the data slate he is perusing as he says, That's enough, Barbon. Heal. One of these days, Thaddeus, says he, pushing past me and barking down into my face. I like you more now, boy. Then over his shoulder as he passes, At least he is a sort of human. Sort of? Oi! said I, but only towards his back as Barbon is quickly gone. The situation is diffused. How did he do that? Draw Barbon's fire so swiftly. The old man looked at the Jacaro, and they both rolled their eyes and then laughed, before turning and going back to what they were doing, where they were going. It was so odd. Thaddeus looked at me for a second as Louis waddled away in his strange gait. <sighs> it's why Louis had to stay at the base for a while, you see. Barbon and he don't get on. It worked well for a while, but Louis pushed it too far. He has a tendency to do that. <laughs> incorrigible. Utterly incorrigible. Of this, I am soon very certain myself. For I am the victim of one of Louis's japes. I am walking along one of the dingier lower levels of the vessel. When I meet him, I like the quiet down here. Also to talk with the people who have, for generations untold, had the ship as their home. Their tales are simple, but proud. While down a particularly dank route, I am suddenly accosted by the sight of Louis, sitting in the middle of the thoroughfare. Next to him is a small sack. As I get closer, his hand extends, and a metal object flies toward me. I extend my hand and catch it. A small ring, but one I soon find fits me perfectly. Why, thank you, Louis, says I, in my most avuncular tone. He then snorts at my condescension, and a field of energy appears over me. I am startled, but not scared, as it covers me in a dome. At that, Louis now rummages in his bag and draws out a long yellow fruit of some form. I can feel the heat from the barrier. It is a force shield of some form. Hmm. I know Louis is a colleague of Thaddeus, but this does seem a bit like an attack. But then, he is not exactly threatening me, just has me contained. He now makes eye contact with me as he peels the long fruit in a very lewd way. Then in a flash he bites into it hard, consuming half in one gulp. And for some reason my hands clutch my privates of their own accord, as he then reaches into his bag for another. 
oddly intimidating, if I can be honest. He drags out another and then throws the old peel onto the top of the Dome of Energy. It fries for a second, creating this sickly sweet odour that does nothing to reassure me. And so, I think. All while he peruses me like an ant in his palm. I look at the ring he gave me. It is of an amazing artifice, intricately woven with gems and patterns. I twist it, touch every gem, trace every line. As I do this, the ape just languidly golf claps me. Such sarcasm from something that is not reported to be discernibly intelligent, according to all I have read on them. Poppycock, of course. I then watch him instead. Then I clap myself. When I do, a small line of intense heat and a sort of flame licks from the middle of the ring out from my hand. I can feel its heat, but not in the hand that wears the ring. Very odd. I then look at Louis, who is leaning forward and has a mad twinkle in his eye that so reminds me of Thaddeus. I sigh. I know what it wants me to do. It wants me to escape. The field is too powerful, nor do I know how it will react to this heat lance on my middle finger. So I kneel down and begin to cut the deck. Beneath is a hatch, as always. So that is my route to freedom. The orange ape now sits back doing what can only be laughing hard, as it waits for me to get halfway round a circle beneath me, before standing slowly, nodding in approval, and then turning around and bounding off again, laughing some form of hard belly laugh. The field goes down as I stand, and I am showered in charred and blackened fruit peels that will somehow permeate my clothes so they stink thus for a week. Days later, and we are approaching the system we will be picking up Devrin from. Only Thaddeus knows what he has been up to, but I'm sure it will be interesting. So much is changing so quickly, and I know that Thaddeus has something big planned. I do not miss his signs. I forget nothing. What he said to Tiggy on Ultramar was utterly candid. He intends to take us into some very dangerous waters very soon, so he said. We meet on the disembarkation bay. Thaddeus is there with Louis when Barbon, Ursula and I appear. Ursula does not bat an eyelid at the presence of the Xenos, the Jokero, Louis, so she must have seen him on the ship. We board the small shuttle, and the Jokero leaps into the pilot chair, but is then lifted up and unceremoniously deposited into the co-pilot seat by a disgruntled Barbon. The two of them slap and prod each other for the next few minutes, as the ape seems to be purposefully annoying the Marine by leaning forward and performing half of his pre-flight prep for him, only to have his hands consistently slapped away by Barbon. The farce ends when Thaddeus asks them if they are quite ready to fly. They both seem to scowl at each other as Barbon snaps. Aye! The flight is uneventful, as Louis seems to behave as soon as we actually take off. But it is less fun when we land. A pre-agreed placement. We slam down towards the planet as we always do when Barbon is piloting anything. Get there fast and functionally, but certainly not comfortably. He does not have the grace to do anything but, well, not without a sword in his hand at any rate. As we get closer to the ground, we see the flash of Lasgun fire darting across the very place we are supposed to make a landfall. A green clearing in the midst of a huge forest, cutting through the cover of the canopy as the discharge from the Lasguns is so very bright. Thaddeus looks through the view screen and simply barks. Ursula, shields up! Barbo, Louis, it's time to play piggyback. Now don't moan! If we are being ambushed, then it means Devrin has attracted a spot of bother. And if Devrin was unable to shake them, then they mean business and highly dangerous. So get out there in the old way, gents. No fussing or moaning. And at that, both Barbon and the Jukera roll their eyes and bounce into action. The Marine moves forward deliberately, but with an alacrity it is strange to witness so close up. He strides past Ursula and Thaddeus and I, toward the now lowering doors. Next I witness the ape jump onto his backpack and actually put the helm on him as they move into the woods. 
Sadia signals that the rest of us should stay in the ship, protecting against the Lasgun fire coming towards us in more of a torrent now. And I see the two of them in action. This. This is why Thaddeus picked up Louis. It has to be. For as Balbon strides into battle, Laz gunfire bouncing off his armor when it does connect, I see it all. The Marine fires tight one-shot rounds again and again, changing his targets in less than a second. And I know each and every one of those bolts hits. He is the son of Dawn, after all. But when he finishes his clip, he hands his gun backwards to the Jokero and takes out his bolt pistol and continues firing. As soon as the bolt pistol is dry, he passes it back and takes the bolter that Louis has reloaded for him. But this is not effective, thinks I for a second. Then I notice something. The bolt's coming out of Barbon's gun. He is no longer only aiming at what he can hit. He is firing through trees, as the rounds now cut through anything in their path. All the while, the Jukero is tinkering with something in the magazines while holding onto Barbon's backpack for dear life. But they seem so natural this way. They have done this before many times, I suspect. A large blast rings out after the light of it near blinds all who see it. A lance cannon shot hits Barbon dead center. But instead of the horror of his death, I witness the exact same shield I saw earlier, a force field from the Jukero. Barbon takes no risks and snaps a full four shots into the forest from whence it came, and there is an explosion. It seems the cannon is now out of action. They must be highly trained to have tagged Barbon at all. These are no mere scum. As they are getting closer, despite Barbo and Louis calling their number, I start to see their uniforms more clearly. Like Astra Militarum, but with carapace armor. Better equipment, better guns. Whoever they are, they are trained and equipped as Tempestus Scions. This is certainly no joke, and we are in great danger. While Barbon lays down fire, I fear a familiar thought structure in my mind. Devlin is coming, but he is not alone. Ursula is picking off targets in all of this as well. She does nothing but the swiftest, kindest kill she can manage. As when she looks at one of our assailants, the head twists 180 degrees and they fall like rag dolls. I am glad there is too much noise from the bolter to hear the sickening cracks that must be echoing around outside the ship. Thaddeus is picking off some too, but rarely. His accuracy is good, but he is not Barbon nor Devrin. And it is now that he makes his presence known. As over the next five seconds, multiple scions drop with pinprick holes in their heads. Well, at the fronts anyway. And then further lasgun fire comes crackling from where we are landed, aimed towards the scions. Devrin had brought reinforcements. The signs have been accumulating. The reality of the situation has not been lost on those of us who know. Who know how to look. Who know how to see. We, the traditions. It has been hundreds of years or more since this has happened. A joint campaign. A gathering. A crusade in miniature. We, the Inquisitors of the Traditions, the names. We try not to gather more than a pair of us at any time. We can never be sure the other has not been corrupted, has not been turned. But this is different. I didn't call this one, but I could not miss it. The author of the summons is beyond reproach. I've seen him recently, and I know him well. We all do. He's even more popular than we are. Saurot. And we all know why he has called us. The only reason that he would do so. He has found him. Long have we hunted, but none more ferociously or as diligently as Saurot. And it's going to take more than a pair of us to do this, even the best of us. So we gather at his behest, knowing what he will tell us. 
We gather to hunt down a bastard that has eluded us for 7,000 years. It's finally time. Finally. Time for some revenge. I'm looking forward to this. The enemy. Humans. He has slain more of us than starvation, some say. Inquisitors. He has slain more of us than any demon prince. And the traditions. He has ended seven of the lines. But this will be the hardest thing we've ever done. Any of us. So force majeure may not be enough. But majeure or not, I am gathering my forces. Those I bring to this life, not entrusted only to the next. To the hundreds. I rarely keep my own tally, my own bonds. So I call them. I call them all. As the days go by, they will arrive. Not here, of course. Somewhere safe. And as I mobilize, so will the others. Each of us will bring different strengths, different resources. The accumulated might will be noticed, of course, but not before we are on our way. And from then on, there can be no turning back. No mercy, no remorse, no weakness of any form. If we slip, even one of us, then we will drag down all around us. For that is what he does. He destroys everything he comes into contact with. Twists and use it, leaves it drained of all worth, replaced with a thing of horror. At last, we can end this tyranny at long last. But I must have the one. All hinges on him. It is time to go to war. We will need him. The hundreds will need him. For afterwards. But how do I get him? Ah, but where was I? I'm jumping ahead, I know I am. Oh yes, that firefight. Nasty business. Now, where were we? The situation is getting a bit dire, if I'm honest. Not my ideal outcome. Barbon, my most trusted aide, a space marine, and not just any space marine, is smashing as many of them as possible, which is quite a few, I can tell you. As expected, he is a son of Rogal Dawn, after all. But there are many. The large Jakero on his back is making the situation a little easier, but it's obvious to me that I should have picked up Louis earlier. Much earlier. They are not jetting as they once did. The proof of this comes almost poetically into play as the scions assailing us attempt to outflank and surround Barbon and Louis. Fire is now coming at them from three cardinal points, and even Barbon is not infallible. He's lit up again by a concentrated, coordinated pattern from half a dozen of the scions or more. Their hotshot lance guns in the hands of experts. <laughs> they tag him more than once. Now Louis Shielding is able to block most of it, but not all. I hear a loud, disgruntled, ape-like scream as Louis Shielding goes down under a deluge of fire and one shot hits his left leg. Barbon would not let him get hit, despite how he feels about the Xenos. He's permitted him onto his back, so it wasn't him being difficult. Also, I have asked it, so Barbon will do his best. He always does. No matter how unpalatable the operation I give him. He'd tear a strip off me in private later, but he always does what he is ordered to do. Dependable. God, I love Barbo. A side note. Have you ever had a widgie from a marine? I got one, and I can tell you, it's no laughing matter. I practically had to get laser cutters to remove my undies from a crease. Ah, well, I deserved it. Crud. Should not have taken them so lightly but he hasn't done that in about 200 years. I think he realised I was not a whippersnapper after my second redo. Never had one since. But then, we did agree back then, at that point. Why? Because I could not be bothered to have a five-hour sermon from him whenever I dropped the ball in those earlier years. 
so we agreed on non-lethal, or crippling for that matter, rebukes instead. Always in private, of course. And why? Because it only took a few hours to recover from those, meaning that, in the grand scheme of things, I would be about three hours up on the transaction. Perfect. Yes, I am an inquisitor. Yes, I could have ordered Barbon to put his gun in his mouth and pull the trigger. And he would have done it. He swore an oath. And that man is steel. Not iron. Oh, no. He is steel. He would have done it. <laughs> Probably just to spite me, I think. But let's be honest. I made plenty of minor blunders back then. Nobody is perfect. Everyone learns every day. If you try to project perfection, never accept fault or error, then you are never going to gain the loyalty of your men and women. Without loyalty, an inquisitor soon descends into paranoia. Never pretty. Paranoia and power should never, ever be married together in the one place. Ever. Ah, back to the battle. Louis is angry, very. He smashes both of his hands down on top of Barbon's helmet before rolling backwards and landing hard on the ground. But he's not an idiot either, ah, oh, Louis. Barbon had backed away into cover before the Jacaro struck. Nor would it do more than barely register with the Marine. But it would register. He let him know he was pissed off. Barbon does not turn, laying down fire that keeps them both safe for a period, but shrugs his shoulders. About as much of an apology as he is going to ever give to the Xenos. But it was there. The apology. I clocked it. Realising that they are aiming at him, not Louis, Barbon rolls forward and bounds from cover to cover, bracken and bushes exploding in flames all around him as he moves, lasers firing everywhere. The sirens are closing on him, but he is drawing fire away from Louis and, of course, our transport, with Ursula Tarquinus and I still inside. Louis slams a strange metal cylinder onto his leg, but rolls on the floor in pain at it. The stench of burnt jacaro hair permeates the entire region. A pong so wretch-inducing, it seems to overpower everything else. One of the downsides of working with a jacaro, I guess. The pong. Even in battle. Ah well, moving on. As Barbon is looking like he's in deep water, despite Ursula twisting the heads off more than a few, three scions fall with neat little pinpricks in their heads. Devrin is here and from the fire now flying from behind the transport into our enemy. He has bought the friends I asked him to collect. But even so, even with the assistance from Devrin and his comrades, it isn't looking particularly clever out there. Time to move things along and test out the bot. Sorry, Tarquinus. I turn to him and bite off. Well? What? I'm shooting as best I can. You tit, says I, putting on my best sneer. What? He blurts, looking genuinely hurt. <laughs> Aren't you a bloody psyker? What? You're a telepath. Order the science to throw down their weapons. That's even the odds for our ads, at least. But, but, but she said not to. Really? If they're just throwing down their weapons, then the battle is over, right? But, but she said not to. Not yet. You take orders from a senior inquisitor or your mommy. At that, I lean forward and flick his ear. It'll hurt, of course. But it's not to intimidate. It's to break him out of the cyclic navel-gazing involved in weighing up his loyalty to his trainer against the word of his inquisitor. Me. It works. He takes a rebuff and goes back to form. I thought that would end. Get on with it. Yep, sorry. At that, Tarquinus's eyes begin to look like they have lights behind them. Like his head contains a star. He snaps his head up and is clearly not focusing with his vision as his pupils roll up into the back of his head. He's looking with his mind. He furrows his brow, starts to whisper about the skull of Progenium. <laughs> he is connecting with them. He whispers, Who? Who do they trust most? Then with a nod of his head, he has found it. His eyes burst with even more intensity. It is at this point that the science has won. All seem to slow down, and then, like zombies, they drop their hotshot las guns onto the forest floor. At this, I stand and bellow, At them! Now! Charge! And I pat Tarquinus on the back and gain his attention as his eyes lose their luminosity. 
Well done, Tarquinus. Well done. I whip my head around to see what is happening. Ha! <laughs> Me between he and them. Tarquinus. I don't want him to see. Yep. As predicted, it's revenge time. Barbon loses not a second as he drops his bolter and draws out his power sword and is on them in a flash. The distance between them eaten with only three of his huge loping jumps. The forest bursts into life around him as a half dozen or more catachans roar as they charge in, long knives out and look of pure hatred on their faces. And as they pass the transport they are being led by Devrin. Hello lad. The scions are men of valour, some of the best shock troops humanity has to offer. But when they are caught in close by the Catachans, they are soon ripped apart, let alone what Barbon is doing to their central column. A loud growling, then a shout of anger comes from a bush, and out springs Louis on them. He takes two of the scions that were furthest away, and his huge strength comes into play. You see, so many people look at the technical marvels that he or any of his kind create, and somehow commute the anti-intellectualism so rife in humanity and think that he is bookish, hence weak. Louis grabs one of them and hurls them at a tree. The tree fares better than the back of the scion from the crack that resounds around the clearing. He then bounds onto the next one, knocking him down, and then stands above him and pummeling down with his huge fist, blood fountaining up from his bare knuckles as he hits again and again. He keeps going until there is nothing left of the scion but a smear. Barbon has decapitated a score of them if one, when the last turn tail and run, but they are hunted down by the Catachans like they were orcs. Poor sods. But there again, they started it. Tarkinus knows what has happened from his intervention. I hear him mutter a bit about it, but he does not confront me. Good. I am in no mood to put up with his naivety at present. So I grab him when we walk to the clearing. Barbon has, as always, identified who the Scions are. I watch him roll one over and check their tags, their iconography. He checks a few more before walking over to me to report. OK, so who sent them? says I. Local Scions, a local enemy, says Barbon. Gotcha. Thought he'd stay out of this. Ah, uh, well. Let's watch ourselves. This was just a calling card. A calling card, says Tarquinus. Yep, a message. The game is afoot. Should we be worried? Oh, yes! But not for long. We'll soon be at the rendezvous point. Hopefully we'll get there. And so we end the day back on the transport. But this time, it is filled to the rafters. But then... This many catachans in a confined setting is always going to be olfactorily challenging. But Devrin has succeeded. He has what is left of his old regiment with him. OK, that's less than a score of them now. But each and every one of them is a veteran. Each and every one of them has worked with us before. They know what to do. They know who we are going to try to take down. They witnessed his butchery. It was how I first met Devrin. And they are ready to help me hunt this bastard down. Oh, yes, they are. Good. <sighs> it is at this point my master turns to me and says those two words. Those two words I have come to dread. And out they come. You tit. <sighs> Story continued from Thaddeus and Tarkonus' playlist. We sit under a darkening sun, its primal energies now mere embers. Now it is weak, its light is dim, its fires all but spent. I meditate in the observation hall, 
I am bathed in its dimming light. It is dying, preparing to transform, to take on the next part of its journey. I know how it feels. Though I am at the exact opposite point, for my fire burns at near its peak. In short years, I shall reach my zenith. Then, like the sun in miniature, in both size, power, and longevity, I shall wane. I shall burn less brightly. I shall prepare to transform. Strange I use that word when I consider my mortality. I, like all mortals, will cease to be. <laughs> Avoidance again. How odd. I am not usually so oblique, so cowardly. I will die. There. I have thought it. Now one might previously have considered this to be the end. For most it is. For the vast majority of sentient beings in the galaxy, it is final. Yet there is one more element. What happens afterwards? For the greenskin, there is no need for concern, for they are either nothing, or they are returned to the gestalt beings we designate their entities, their deities. Collections of their raw power, their subconscious will, they call them Gork and Mork. For the Tau, perhaps there is nothing. That has yet to be seen at the very least. For the majority of humanity, we are told that when we expire, our bodies finally or violently ending, then we are taken into the loving embrace of the Emperor, to sit at his feet, to witness his splendor. Yet is that true? Or do we simply fall apart? Our soul energies in the warp simply drifting away from one another, as we die, our souls unravel to be simply absorbed into the hellscape that is the warp. Perhaps. It could be worse, of course. It could be much, much worse. For what starters' blessings can sometimes become curses. Thus it is with the Elder, I am told. For they once reincarnated, their souls moving from one life into the next, when their bodies died, they simply retained their senses, drifting in the immaterium until a new elder host body was birthed. A sublime existence without end, without fetter. Yet, this has become their curse. For when they die, they do not simply unravel as we. They retain their sentience and whole as they once did. Yet this is when they are found by the one they call she who thirsts. Slanesh, the Prince of Pleasure, is what we call him. It was formed by them, the Eldar. They made a being that would call itself a god, a dark one at that. What they must have experienced, the things they must have done to have midwifed such a horror, it does not bear deep contemplation. Yet, when they die, they are now consumed by it. The parent consumed by their child. It is said to be deeply unpleasant. I can only imagine. So, so few humans know of any of this, of course. Why would they? Most are not permitted to know even the basics of the reality of the galaxy about how many and how dangerous are the threats to humanity, our Imperium. Perpetually hanging on the knife's edge. Oh, we are all perpetually told of the enemy that ravens at our door. All across the galaxy, humanity endures. We do not thrive or move forward. We simply endure. We have the Emperor. Well, I shall think on that more another time. It is not for today. But most do not really, truly understand the plight we are all in, constantly. And even those who do know about the threat of the alien, the Xenos, 
they do not know what I know. About the beings that stalk the night, the ones that hide behind the veil, ever testing us, ever trying to push through, ever trying to enter real space. There are few ways that they can gain true corporeal existence in our realm, nor are they long here most often, but there are always degrees of influence, and all it takes is one bad day, one bad decision, one whispered plea, and they gain a foothold. First in the soul, then it grows. If fed, it can then slowly begin to affect the mind. Then finally, when it gains utter dominance of the heart, head and soul, then it can possess. It will have a physical method of enacting its heinous schemes, all bent to more of its kind appearing or to its individual power. But when this power grows enough, invariably and inevitably, they always summon hordes of their kind through. Demons. It is what we call them, or in this case, the dark gods of chaos. There are a myriad of names that they have used across a hundred centuries, across a million worlds, more. They have hunted and corrupted races before us, have surged and slaughtered entire civilizations. Yet, my instructor says that most agree it is humanity who have birthed three of them out of four alone. But when they formed, they had the ability to split elements of themselves off, to create minor copies of their degenerate form and function, the demons that we face. There are a myriad of lesser deities and beings, intelligence and malevolent things in the warp, yet each comes back to its core. They are warp beings. They are not like us. And they are to be destroyed. For if the decision is left to them, they would control us all, humanity in its total, and they would make our universe into a copy of theirs. They would turn it into hell. I think on all of this today, as I have for the last few days, the days we sit under this dying sun. We are waiting for someone Thaddeus told us all that he has spread his net wide, and here is where we expect to pick up another ally. We are hidden as best we can, due to the local issue that Thaddeus mentioned, yet is still unwilling to explain to me. Odd. But then, it's an odd time. But he has revealed who we are, hopefully, waiting for. He added the hopefully himself. Hence, I am not entirely sure, he is entirely sure. Perhaps his authority is not what it was. Perhaps he has dimmed like this star. Personally, I do not think this is the case. If anything, I think he is more concerned about if they still live. He has been bombing around the galaxy for quite some time now. Yet very soon... I shall see how utterly pathetic that last thought was. For I am about to meet people who have lived for not decades, not centuries as he has, but for millennia. It is time. I sense them before the klaxon goes off and I am summoned to the bridge. Strange that I could feel them arrive, but then the galaxy has become a thing of wonders and terrors to me since I met my tutor. I used to call him Master, but not now. It sometimes pops out, but even he corrects me on it now. He is my tutor. He is my benefactor. He is my superior in the order. He is my friend. To think that one such as I should have a friend such as he. I come from a backwater world now in ashes. He 
as a chosen son of Ultramar, of Macrag. Yet he claims I will be the greater, that his entire life has led him to this point, to finding me, to my training, to my taking the mantle from him when the time is right. Alas, we both know, the time will be when he expires. But the vision, I cannot stomach the thought of the end fate seems destined for him. I will not allow it. And I am no slouch these days, no matter how humble my beginnings, for I am one in a million. I am a psyker, but even amongst my own kind, I am one in a million. I am powerful, beyond scope, is what he had stated. Of course, I do not see this, do not feel this. He states it is a yet. I think it is perhaps his wishful thinking. But no matter what, I will not disappoint him. I will allow him to pass, thinking I am his greatest find, no matter what the reality may be. For I am supposed to be the hundredth in the line. I am being specifically trained to be the next Thaddeus. But perhaps it is not the hundredth that matters so much as a continuation of the line. Even he admits humans find meaning in patterns that are not even there. If that is true, then all I need do is fulfill the role as best I can. Then I can find my successor. Maybe they will be the one. Maybe it will be many after them. But as I have thought again and again, I will not be the one to break the line. I will not fail him. Not now. Not ever. The call goes out. I rise from the lotus position and feel the blood returning to most of my extremities. More blood, I should say. As taught, I have always had control. I have kept the required amounts of sustenance flowing to the areas that need it. Yet, now, I feel light. As I stride, each boot connection with the metallic floor resounds, like a chime of its own a meditation bell. It brings me out of myself and back to reality. And with each step, I feel the mildest of flutters in my stomach again. Nerves. I am indeed nervous. Despite my moments of calm, I know why one of them is calming. At least one of them. For I have not yet had my training. He swore I would be honed like a lump of ore into a steel blade. He swore I would be trained by the very best. Of course, he could have been referring to my first tutor in these arts. If I am rare, then she is unique. Of a bloodline that is sacred, she helped me through those first days and weeks, showed me things I will never forget, revealed things I would wish to, Yet she also helped me to become centered, to be able to protect myself and those around me. Not in the ways that Thaddeus wants, of course, but in the ways that were most important at the time. She showed me how to veil my presence in the warp, how to mask my thoughts, how to not invade the thoughts of others, generally. The three keys she called them the three keys to silence. And I cannot imagine surviving even these past few months without them. I pass the threshold of the deck and take one last look back. I should not be able to see them out there so distant in the darkness of the void. I should not be able to even sense anything outside of my immediate range of vision. Yet, there are many things that go with my ability. Many. Those who do not know 
have never tasted it, never lived it. They like to catalogue and name us, subdivide and explain us. They attempt to make sense of something senseless, something mystical, something ephemeral. So I am dubbed a telepath, just as Ursula is classified as a telekinetic. Yet we are so much more. And I can see their shuttle move through space like a fish through water. No bursts of power from its rear. This small cutter moves with the solar winds. I can see the light bouncing off its sails as it moves towards us. I will keep this for myself. Not a secret, par se, but something personal. For now, now I am an inquisitor. In training, perhaps, but I hold the title. I should have mysteries of my own, abilities that none know of but me. For the reality of the situation is stark. I am now an inquisitor. And not just anyone. I am a chosen successor of a tradition, the wisdom. Any of our entourage could be deep agents of the enemy. Yes, it is hard to look at any of my friends thus. But Thaddeus has taught me well. Friends is a term of endearment to an Inquisitor, but it does not have the meaning attributed by all others of our race. For the friend of an Inquisitor is merely a person he or she will miss when they are gone. Nobody is above suspicion. Nobody can be truly trusted. Not even our closest aides. For in a universe where an enemy can possess them, or simply slay them and wear their faces, even for decades, there can be no true friendship. Despite being his only chance, he stated even then, he gave me the choice. When I had awoken, been finally let off that slab and its restraints, after talking, after being scanned and doused in holy water, having my skin touched by silver, having my best checked for infection. After a hundred other tests, he deemed I was who I said I was. He deemed me free of taint. At least as much as he could then. Of course, there have been further tests, like when he wheeled me out into the presence of Tiggy, as he called him. But he did offer me the choice. He let me know what my life would be. To be not the hunter, but the hunted. To be hated by all of humanity. To be despised by all I defended. For all of the Imperium to want me dead, as often as they wanted and needed my help. And kith and kin, hearth and home, even the warmth of the campfire of travellers on the same journey, even amongst those I had collected as my trusted few. Even then, I would be alone, forever. Never to drop my guard, never to show pity or mercy or clemency, if in one iota of doubt. I could smile and smirk, charm and chat, but deep down, every word I uttered, every deed I performed, all of it was a sacrament, a task. A duty. For every second of every day, I would sacrifice my own will, wishes, hopes and dreams. I would sacrifice my entire being, all I was, all I could ever be, every moment, to him, to the Emperor, to his righteous goal, the protection of humanity. And so I walk. I make my way to the bridge, yet halfway there I turn around as they all pass me. In silence, Barbon glowers at my perceived tardiness, I presume, but then it could be as well about my merest existence. Barbon will never love me as he does my, as he does Thaddeus. I am a mutant. I am a threat. He may like my personality or our shared loyalty to Thaddeus. But oaths or not, he will never be to me as he is to my tutor. 
Ursula wanders past as well, still cold and aloof. <sighs> I hope she will forgive me one day, but that day will certainly not be any time soon. Louis and Devlin are next up. Devrin makes a swift lurch towards me with a raised fist. I duck back a little, just out of swinging range. He chuckles as he passes, the punch unthrown. Louis looks up at me for a second, giving me his strange leer. But waddles past as the head of our little group follows up, his orange fur kind of swishing as he moves. And there he is, my tutor. My superior, Thaddeus. Oh, you made it! Wonderful! I was wondering if I would have to come and throw a bucket of slop on you to break the navel-gazing. Thank you for your legendary restraint. Oh, think nothing of it. I deem it more a reprieve than a cancellation. I'll catch you at it yet, mark my words. So, Xenos uh, then? They've arrived? Funny way of putting it, if you don't mind me saying. Especially as you've met one of them before. Best to keep your mouth shut until you understand the lay of the land, says he. Strong and unsubtle use of language from him there. Understand. Understanding takes time, as he always said. So he expects me to be very docile for a while. Why? I'll try not to put my foot in it. Try means bugger all to me, Tarquinus. Got it. Top of the class as usual. Don't mess it up. We walk down to the hangar. It's not large, but it can take a shuttle coming in. Just. But this is no normal ship. No normal shuttle. We all stand there, fanned out to left and right of Thaddeus. He is the central point. They are, after all, coming to see him, not any of us. I look down the lines. Barbon, the huge space marine in all black armor, covering what would once have been chapter markings. He stands at Thaddeus' right hand. His bolter is on his side, his power sword at his shoulder. He can get that thing out before anyone can blink. Ursula is as ravishing as usual, yet cowled. No part of her face is showing under the gossamer veils. She wears her most official-looking robes, appearing far more officious than she is, far more magical, distant. Devrin as at my left, and I at that is his. He is looking serious, stern, but he is not overly worried. His stance says it all. Louis seems to be sanguinely standing behind Thaddeus, slightly to his right perhaps ready to leap onto the back of Barbon, as he has done before to such telling effect. Or perhaps he is angling himself perfectly between the protection of Thaddeus's refraction field and the towering space marine. Either way, nothing is harming Louis unless it goes through those two. What a clever ape. And then it arrives. I can see it before any here. I would wager. Again, I'm not really sure how. Okay, I have my augmented eye, but that is not what I use to clear the distance. Like a lens in my mind's eye, as was shown me by my first master, when I did not even know I was gifted, when she shut down the navigators of our pursuers, I see the ship coming. It is sleek and beautiful, graceful in its every movement. This, I soon discover, is only a reflection of those who built this wonder. It comes in, and the metallic wing folds like satin as it approaches our vessel. It glides on nothing, making no sound at all, as it slows, and then finally pushes its way through our energy field. The one that keeps the air in this deck from flooding out into the void. It is sheen and sleek. It is silent and looks deadly. The thing lands without the obvious use of thrusters, yet I feel some form of change in the air as it does so. Gravitics, I would imagine. But then, does it really matter? 
We cannot use their technology any more than they would choose to use ours. The vehicle opens with only the mildest of hisses, and a gangway calmly extends down to the deck. As it moves, so do those who have arrived. Their motions so silk and smooth, hypnotic, yet with a tinge of pain and barely controlled speed, like a stalking carnivore, they move with implied threat, yet with a grace that would bring any performer to tears. Eldar, two of them. One walks first, the other behind. The distance between them is more than ceremony, more than etiquette. The first is the leader, the other attached, but I can sense that they are not really together. I recognize the latter elder. I have seen it before. It saved our lives. More to say, it saved Thaddeus's life. Mine was a collateral gain of circumstance only. The first Eldar is tall, willowy, but poised. I find I will run out of adjectives to describe their sublime movements. They are ancient beyond belief. I know this. Can feel it exuding from them as a starving man would smell cooking meat. The first is dressed as one of their lords, so much I can tell, or so much I hope for such opulence is beyond belief. Each and every millimeter of his robes are adorned with tiny sigils, microglyphs that make up entire patterns. I can feel the power contained therein. Every inch of him screams majesty. Every bangle, brooch, or ring is covered with arcane script. His helm is tall and its face mirrored. None can see his features. None can know his mind. I can detect nothing from him. I do not probe. I am not that stupid. But usually there is a background whisper from all I meet. But not him. The Lord of the Eldar walks towards us firmly, with purpose as much as poise. He then gets to within comfortable speaking distance and stops. His hands extended at his side in a welcome of sorts. Out of the corner of my eye, I see that the same stance is taken by Thaddeus. I do not break my stare at these interlopers. Ha! Huh. I should be more mindful of my thoughts. That is the propaganda for the many. They are guests. Our guests are now close enough to open the proceedings. Thaddeus steps forward once. Your light illuminates the darkest corners of my humble vessel. You exalt us with your presence, Great One. Walker of the paths most perilous. The elder responds. Thank you, Thaddeus. Ever the genteel facade. It is somewhat appreciated. You know why I have called you. Of course. Your strands are well known to me and mine. The pact holds? It does indeed. My successor. He needs to be aware. Yes, he does. But our confidence is not the same as yours. His strands are hidden. He is a concern. We will need test him. He is my successor. Which is something you will have to live with. Ask not that we die for your naivety. Then how do we progress? A measuring he will pass. He had better do, for your sake. He is now all the hope you have, Thaddeus. I am more than aware. You will look at my things? Yes. We always do when we answer your call, do we not? I do not like to presume. In this, if only in this, you do not presume. It is part of the pact. We fulfill our obligations. Aye, you always have. Now, we must discuss the situation. He must be witnessed, measured. Aye, we shall discuss this in private first. Of course. You did not say that he was with you. 
intoned the elder while looking past Barbon. Oh, um, no, guess not. Thaddeus stepped back slightly to permit no blockage between them. And with that, the Lord of the Elder then bowed his deepest bow. It was not to Thaddeus. It was to Louis, a fellow survivor. And Louis put knuckle to forehead and bowed his head in return. It was quiet, personal, just for them. Only they understood. They were both survivors of the First War. They knew things, had seen things, we could never even comprehend. Louis then grimaced at the other elder, the one loitering behind. It went near none, backed away from all. But then it happened. The thing. It introduced itself. <laughs> Ursula shrank away from the noise. Deverin took a step sideways. So he was more free to act. Barbon did not move a muscle, but his gaze at the Eldar was steely. I had that spine-tingling rush as the noise echoed around the room, spectral, terrifying. But not to me. Despite the history, despite knowing what it was, still... The sound did not scare me as it did the others, because inside the laughter I could hear the sadness, the pain, the resignation. This was a cursed being, a being touched and now owned by its nemesis, the most lethal of all elder kind in any dimension. It was a solitaire, the one who I had witnessed before, the one who saved us, from a chaos-possessed Astartes. Sadius bowed his head. The Eldar bowed so low, it was comical, seemed sarcastic. You came. You came. How could I not? You owe me nothing. We are square. Old friend, old enemy. Unclean one. Dancer of solitude. You do not need to do this. Yes. Not for you, for me. For once, as before, our goals align. But unlike you, I will not ask a boon in return. You humble me. You humble yourself. It is an honor to be in your presence. It is a curse, old friend. We both know this. Save your verbal dainties for the farseer for he is worthy of such niceties. I am here to kill. We all are. Let us not pretend it is anything but a hunt of common cause. Indeed. Let us hunt the bastard together. Indeed, let us. There are quarters away from all others. There are. They are prepared. You will not be disturbed. said the solitaire, with an edge of finality. Right, everyone. It's best not to take risks, so nobody goes within five foot of our friend here, under any circumstances whatsoever. He then turned to me. You especially. You've a bad track record with she who's asked. At this, the farseer seemed to take a tiny shuffle backwards, as if offended, or even scared, purely by the name being uttered. I chose to lighten the moment, playing along with Thaddeus. He knew what he was doing better than I. Oh, ho, ho. I'd hardly make the cut as Ordo Malius if I had to avoid the minions of the Prince of Pleasure. Oh, planned it already, eh? Going to sort yourself out before the big fights, eh? <sighs> you are such a... We're in company, you know. Oh, true. But we're going to be in close proximity for a long time. Best be candid. Oh, right then. No rebuttal, I see, said he with a smirk. Throne knows you're a trial sometimes. Only sometimes? Only sometimes. 
piped in both the Farsia and the Solitaire in unison, much to my surprise. Probably to theirs too, by the looks between them. Indeed! I shall have to try harder, get it up to most of the time. See? said he, nodding in my direction, but looking at the elder. He's full of good ideas as our Tarquinus, always observant, very helpful. And with that, the solitaire and the farseer followed Thaddeus and Barbon away into the ship, the former keeping its distance from the latter. Barbon was between the old man and the elder executioner at every point, but the farseer was given more leeway. He glided along next to the inquisitor as they began to talk in a language he had never taught me, sounds that echoed from the very beginning of the galaxy. Louis watched them go, then utterly absorbed in his own new project, waddled off, perpetually tinkering with something small and metallic that had sparks cascading from it as he went. Devrin let out a sigh of relief, then spun on his heels and wandered back into the ship. Ursula just watched them all go, they seemed to just sag down as they finally disappeared from view. Of course, I understood why. Silence came from the farseer, its mind a thing so complex and disciplined that we could not read a thing. But its compatriot? I had not experienced it when we met before, as I had not yet come into my gifts. Looking at it was a trial as it shifted and moved like a dizzying collage of darkness to our witch sight, where the harlequin armor was light. This thing, the solitaire, was shielded in shadows, and the whispers that issued from its passing were like a nightmare barely remembered, the unsettled feeling all that remained. It was touched by the dark gods, and with every fiber of my being, I had to fight the urge to end it. I now understand the room we made, the glyphs, the wards, sigils and circles. I had thought that we were making a playroom for Thaddeus, in case we managed that rarest of all things, the capture of a never-born. As he always puts it, he likes to give as good as we get. But no. I now know that all of these protections were for this being the solitaire, to keep its influence from punishing the crew, of which there are many, from affecting Ursula and I. We took many days making that room, many. I learned so much. I will remember every second of it, of course. I have placed it front and center in the crystal fortress of my memories. Many hours pass, the Eldar Farsia and Thaddeus in deep discourse, it seemed. When I was summoned, I was not surprised to see the Eldar there, waiting patiently. Thaddeus rose as I entered. The Eldar did not. His helm now on the table between them, his long dour face was on show. His eyes were like crystals, his skin almost translucent. He looked like no Eldar I had ever seen. But then... I had not seen a great many. Thaddeus took the one step toward me and began. Tarquinus, this is Tan Ir Enaid of Craftworld Noon. Among his people, he is called the Soul of Fire, and he is the last living Eldar who has crossed the man we hunt, matched him. Farsia Tan Ir Enaid is a lord of his people. Possibly their most powerful protector. Yet he is here. Despite a known being in dire need, he has answered my call. For he knows the threat this bastard poses. Not just to us. Not just to his craft world. Not just to this sector. But to all and everything in this galaxy. And we are honored beyond belief that he is with us. He wiggled his eyebrows at me but I do not really need the prompt. I bow. I bow low. The Eldar merely tips his glass in my direction. A liquid, like a rainbow storm, is in his exquisite glass. He obviously brought both with him, for there are two more, 
One is near empty and explains the flush on Thaddeus's cheeks, but one is clearly for me. It is half filled only. Thaddeus passes me the liquor. Better sip this, trust me, but you are going to need it. He then retreats to his chair and sits, giving a wave of his hand. It is the turn of the farseer to speak. There is no third chair. I do not sit, but I do take a sip of the drink, nodding to him in gratitude instead of deference. The smell is like the memories of a summer's day. The taste. Perhaps one day I will be able to explain it, be able to note every sensation it elicits from my taste buds. But I feel I could spend a decade just considering how best to describe it. And even the slightest sip makes my head spin slightly and my feet become a thing of memory. I better not drink until he is finished, thinks I. And he begins. You are powerful. Too much so for a monkey, a human. You are a danger. I should end you now and save the galaxy. Yet, you are the successor of the greatest of humans, a paragon of your race. We owe the line of the wisdom all. Without their help, we would be lost to the Dark One. It has been agreed that I, Tan Irenaid, shall teach you. He takes a dramatic sip of his drink, watching me with those crystallizing eyes. He watches me for a reaction, but I know there is more to come. If you pass the measuring. I nod. What would you have me do? The elder stifles a slight curling of the corner of his lips. He bows his head forward slightly looking past his delicate eyebrows with a depth of gaze I have never witnessed before, never experienced, even from Thaddeus. We have found a ship, one of import, to you. I frown, taking another sip of my drink accidentally and instantly regretting it as his face swims, yet his eyes hold me transfixed, pinned to the spot. It holds the last remains of your people, the last survivors who fled before your world was consumed by evil. My mouth drops open. I am not alone. The Eldar gives me a second of joy before taking it all away. They have survived this far, but we do not think it is innocent. The strands of fate show that there is no coincidence in their flight. The warp guides them. And we would have you put them to the question. All of them. My face drops. I am a gog. I will watch your every action. If I find you worthy, I will give unto you the gift rarely received by any monkey. And at that, Thaddeus takes over. We head there now. Within three days, we shall be able to catch this ship. And when we do, we will board her. And you will execute your duties as an Inquisitor, as my successor, and the future of our line. Execute. And if the soul of fire deems you unworthy, he said, our line ends. He will kill me. Story Continued From Thaddeus and Tarquinus Playlist The man before me is small and starved and bedraggled. His wide eyes are ringed with a grey corona of discoloured skin. They are bloodshot and near constantly blinking. 
He has not slept in many days. Not well, at the very least. His hands shake as he reaches for the water I demand he drinks. Well, my eyes went to the cup, and I then frowned at him. It was enough. All he knows is that I am an inquisitor, and that he is in danger. He is not wrong in this assertion. Of course he is. They all are. As a survivor of a dead world, a place taken by the forces of darkness, they all know that I am an immense threat to them. My one word could doom them all. He raises the cup to his lips and sips. When he is convinced that it is indeed water, he opens his mouth wide and guzzles it back. <sighs> I have had them all look at me thus, as if I would need to poison them. But the fatigued mind sees enemies everywhere, sees evil around every corner, or sitting across from them, of course. After he drains the drink, he puts a cup back on the table between us with expert care. He looks sheepish, guilty. But I know. This is because he thinks the water was precious, that he should have restrained himself. There will be no more water brought in, and we both know that. Not until we have concluded this discourse. Yet, in the simple act of consuming, he has already passed a test. The water was blessed by an abbess. It is holy. Yet he does not show any outward signs of discomfort. I look at the cuffs he wears, the ones I put on him the second he walks through the door. He sits in a way that the connecting bangles are on his clothes. I look deeply into his eyes, as I reach forward and place my hands on his. I do not need to exert much force, as I calmly push his hands down, his palms now flat on the table. You will not move from this position. Do you understand? He nods. Yet the metal cuffs now touch his wrists as intended. There is no sizzle, no discomfort in him again no pain. And those cuffs are laced with silver and a dozen other elements or anathema to the tainted. He passes another test. And so, we talk. I've put him on his guard, but now, over the next five minutes, I get him to lower his defenses. I speak of things only we would know about. The pageants, the fairs, the hardships the customs, for we share something in common, something that only he and I and the rest of the refugees on the ship can, for we come from the same world, the same planet, a land taken by the Dark Ones, by chaos. And by the end of the stint, I almost have him laughing, almost. Yet whenever he beams at a memory of a better time, a home, he looks at me, and the light dies from his eyes. My countenance reminds him of his peril. Not my expression, for that is wide and expansive, eye contact regular, and often a smile on my face. Yet as soon as his vision darts to my armor, to my sigil, he quietens again. The duality of it all confuses him, as I want him to be. Confused. Unguarded. But he sings the same song as all of the others, a ship scheduled to leave the planet on that day. The moment brought forward due to the horrors they saw. The skies full of fire and things of the pit, of the warp. Their ship took off with a few others, but those vessels did not make orbit, as they were torn out of the skies by the demons. Only this ship escaped, and one small one before that. 
but I know the smaller craft. That is how my master and I left the world ourselves. Master. <sighs> Sad is. He is no longer my master. Yet in this situation, it does not feel it. For he and the elder Farseer watch me as I work. A special room is this. Surreptitious glyphs mark its walls, and it has an entire side which appears as mirror. Yet on the other side, in the room next to us, both Thaddeus and the Elder can see through it. Both can watch. They do not watch the questioned, but the questioner. They are judging. Me. This is my test. Concluding my initial interrogation of this misbegotten soul, I put an icon of the Emperor before him. He smiles. His eyes glaze over in the usual manner when one sees an image of their god. Yes, this man is a believer. Hence, I do not even bother to instruct him to spit on it, to see him balk or act offended. He is, as far as I can tell, genuine. If he is a servant of darkness, even he does not know it. He was the last. I raise and unchain him from his manacles. I walk to the door and open it and gesture for him to leave. A huge exhale over three seconds is his response. He is nervous, as he should be. But this is not a sign of anything but survivor's guilt. During our conversation, it practically dripped off every sentence, every sentiment. Like so many of them. He questions why he was permitted to live when so many died. He holds this within himself as a talisman of shame. Redundant. But I do not wish to reveal too much. I actually thank him as he leaves. For his honesty. He looks at me dumbfounded as he walks through the door and out to the waiting Devlin and his colleagues. They take the man back to the pens we have prepared. I do not like to see them this way, in the pens, for they are no different to me. We share so much. The joys of the spring, the Emperor's ascension, the harvest ceremonies, the rites of oneness when two were joined for all time in the eyes of the Emperor, the raucous celebrations after, the bubbling brooks and tranquil waterfalls, the expansive fields of crops, all arranged so as to be visually pleasing as well as utterly efficient. Some say that one cannot have both utility and beauty. Our people did not hold to this. And our world was, most certainly compared to most others I have visited, a near-perfect idyll. Never the grandeur or organization of that which I witnessed in Ultramar, on Mighty McCrag. But then, nowhere in the universe can compare to McCrag. <laughs> I check myself. Terror. Holy terror must surely outclass even the home of the Primarch. Yet I do not think I will ever see that place. Just a feeling I have. But then, for one such as I, feelings are not to be ignored. For I am now mighty. Or at the least, I will be, if I can pass this test. The first round of interviews concluded. I have taken the last ten days working through them all, near two hundred. Before, I would have been mentally, spiritually, and emotionally exhausted by the constant game of subtle maneuvers. But not now. I am a man in the midst of carrying out his calling, his vocation. I could not say that I enjoy the experience, but equally, I could not say I despised it either. It simply was. A part of my role I will perform to my best as always, because so much rests on how I perform. 
the fate of our line sat squarely on my shoulders. If I fail here, the line and my life will end. Of this I know. Yet I will not act any differently. I will not be heavy-handed or gauche. If I am to die, I shall do so as myself, stood looking at death dead on. I will not hurry or dawdle. I will be now, as I would be in the future. For only then can I pass or fail honestly. In other words, I follow my training to the letter. And I have been trained well. Thaddeus has seen to that. And so, I collect my icons of water, cup and manacles. I walk to the door behind me and enter the room to give my initial report. And there they are. Both Thaddeus and the Eldar sit stoically and static. They give nothing away whatsoever, as I now bow my head to them both and sit across from them. The glass behind me, the two of them blank-faced. Report, states Thaddeus. I have questioned each and every person on the ship, from highest to lowest. Cut to the chase. I nod in acquiescence. Each of these people have no knowledge of their taint, should they have one. Yet there are inaccuracies in their auras. None have shown any outright aversion to either holy water materials or concepts. Their tales will merge to form a picture. All nuances or discrepancies can be placed at the feet of tension, strain, fatigue or stupidity. They could not understand what they witnessed so their tales vary due to this only. The elder's eyebrow raises as he sticks me again with his piercing cold eyes. A tiny sign, a blatant one from such as he. Yet, deep within their psyche, some of them have dark traits, a fingerprint of potential taint. You garnered all of this from the questions alone, says Thaddeus. No, I have been surface scanning as I questioned them. Using my telepathic abilities blatantly was not appropriate. Yet in the presence of some of them, I can sense a shadow of a whisper. So, your judgment. Oh, I am far from a judgment, Thaddeus. Then how will you proceed now? I'm going to break this down to the three most likely circumstances. And I shall be blunt, it saves time. 1. The entity is jumping from host to host, always a step ahead of me, and by extension you also, as I have asked for candid advice when necessary. Yet I know you will not inform me of your suspicions. It would by rights negate this test. Thus, the traits I detect are its influence lingering, where it has vacated a body I am about to interrogate. It is intelligent. Option two. There is no entity. There is no taint. It has all been a fabrication. A slight tweaking of the orders, so they mimic corruption. Nothing a Farsi of the Elder could not do. Is a test perhaps that of control, and to see if my zeal blinds me to the innocent if I am merely informed that an enemy is present. Perhaps this is all a fraud. Option three. The being is subtle and powerful, and it is of a form and function I have never encountered in book tuition or personal training from you, Thaddeus. The Farseer slowly looked at Thaddeus. Do all Monke students speak thus to their teacher? Or is the child merely rebelling as it does not like the content of our measuring. Neither, said Thaddeus. Tarconis is astute and on the nose here. If he had deployed flattery or dainty mincing of words, then I would know he was being petulant. Standing right here, gents. Oh, stop whining, boy, and get on with your analysis. What's your next step, then? Huh. Well... For brevity, 
I shall outline the top three responses only. 1. Put them all back on the ship and blow it to pieces, or aim it at a local star. Expunge them. 2. Return them to their ship, but escort them to the nearest unimportant and uninhabited planet. Then put them on it and place a marker for them to never be approached. 3. Continue the investigation in a more diligent, more costly way, both in time, effort, and unfortunately, their headcount. But before Thaddeus could even open his mouth, I swept on. The second option is to defray the scenario. It resolves nothing and potentially endangers the larger Imperium if they do carry taint. If it is passed on from one generation to the next, they could eventually be a real threat to all of the systems around them. The first option is lazy, and again, resolves nothing. It teaches us nothing. For my master once told me, better to know what the enemy is up to than to merely destroy it. For in the knowing, one can predict their actions, defeat them again and again from the one victory. It is what I have been told we of the traditions must do. The third option is the one I will take first. For my interest is piqued, not just by their origin, for that is merely an emotional and sentimental reaction. This conundrum, I believe, is the challenge, but it will be costly, both to them and to me. In time and in energy, as I have stated, but potentially even sanity. For the only way to gain further information is to use skills I am not truly experienced in. I will actively scan them, peel back the folds of their minds, and smash down their walls hiding their deepest shames. And there, if it exists, I will find the cause of the taint. This has its cost. The weak minds may be shattered, even a skilled telepath knows they risk all when delving into another's mind in this way. I can do it. She trained me how. But it was always meant as a last resort, not a primary method. Being inexperienced, I will be clumsy, no matter how I try. Many minds may burn at my touch. I will require one full day to rest and recuperate, and prepare myself for this course of action. Should it have your approval, of course. Thaddeus looked at the Elder, who gave no outward motion of approval, agreement, or negativity. Thus did Thaddeus turn back to me and nod. You will proceed with this plan in exactly twenty-four hours. And at that, he and the Elder stood as one, and walked from the room. As they leave, my shoulders sag. I am not ready for this. Not really. And I am definitely not ready for the repercussions of this. But ready or not, I must do this. I must. Otherwise, well, the solitaire is here. Barbon, Devrin, and his crew. There are no lack of cold-blooded killers on this ship. If I do not gain a definite picture, then the last of my people will be... culled. There is no other word for it. So ready or not, cost or not, here I come. I go to prepare. This is going to be bad. Very bad. But it is time to show the steel is not just in the sigil, as Thaddeus says. And so I take to walking, my mind racing, my senses dulled. I take in the ship, as most others must do. Its panels and walkways merge into one, distinct but merely descriptions of direction. Pointers to whether I go in the right direction or not. But when I get there, I stop. I linger at the door. I take a deep breath in, then gently touch the pad. 
The door slides open. The visage before me is bright and welcoming, but my eyes are so complex now. With my normal retina, I can see the colors, the beauty. With my augmented cybernetic eye, I see the speed of action lost on most, the tiny perpetual movements of an elder. People believe that they are always still or otherwise in frantic movement, but this is not so. They glide. But nor are they ever truly at rest, their hair, their fingertips dabbling slightly, communicating their intent, their mood, their words and sentiments all in the one. They have no real need of words between them, yet I am not as he. So, we must use them. Words. Alas, it is then that I instinctively shift into my witch sight, my psychovision, and before me is a well of darkness, a pit that eats all laughter and joy from its surroundings, absorbing the light. A broken heart owned by another, one who will shift and twist every now and again just to let him, the solitaire, know that he is still owned. He is beholden. His destiny is her more. A deal with the devil. He is both beautiful and tragic and terrifying to behold. All in the one. I take two paces. One to, one beyond his threshold. The threshold to his room. I instantly feel the pressure on my mind, my brain, my soul as the glyphs and wards now suppress everything both he and I are. He comes up from his comedically exaggerated and long-held bow. I do not look in his eyes, because I cannot. He wears his mask forever now, unable to hide from us what he is, unable to hide from the enemy any longer. He is a being treading his last path, he goes to die, and he challenges the universe to take this life. He is a solitaire. Thus, he is damned. To what do I owe this honor, Inquisitor Tarquinus? I bow, but halt and look at him in shock. I recover quickly and right myself. Inquisitor Tarquinus. The first time I have ever been addressed thus, and for it to be true. No matter what happens now, I took the oath. I am his mandated servant. I am his hammer. I am his holy inquisitor. I can do this. And thus, I speak to the solitaire. I ask for a boon. Do not use that word, Inquisitor. It means more than you know. You mean, in your language, surely, a favor. Nay, I know my mind, and I know my language, and I know what it costs. I ask for a boon. He bows again. Ask. But I guarantee nothing, Inquisitor Tarquinus. I wish to ask you of the enemy. I know you are owned, so I know that you are accustomed to its wiles. You, far more than any, even, in my clumsy estimation, the mighty Farseer. His bow comes up. He looks me straight. How do you come to this estimation? Because you were tricked by those same wiles. So you, more than anyone else, you know what they are. You, who have lived long, must have walked through your life's path a million times, trying to work out where it all went wrong. Where you were put on the path to, your plight. Do not think to pity me, Inquisitor. There is none of that. Revulsion, if I am honest. 
which I feel I must be. He counters. Yet you would offer me a boon to call on when I wished. <sighs> Taking the first step on your own way down the same road, perhaps even a more slippery and a swift fall awaits you. Not so. For I give this boon to you, not your master. I condition that you will not be able to ask me for an evil act, will not be able to use me for the benefit of your master, will not make me endanger others. The boon, as with this conversation, will be with the mighty son of Eldenesh that I see before me. For your soul is promised to her, but it is still yours. You still command it until the day she has you, and not a day before. And that will be our compact, that I will talk to you as you were, who you are, not what you have become. <laughs> the solitaire could not help his heritage. His harlequin life was more than just dances and death. It was everything, and he dramatically swung back with his torso. Yet, despite how closely they looked to humans when in Picts, their movements were otherworldly. His upper half, his torso, almost seemed to double back as his arms came up in a dramatic defensive posture, then a spin and a whirl of his clothes, and he was now bent down on one knee. His arms spread out wide, his head down. My memories are yours, as is my blade. Understand this, Inquisitor Tarquinus. One day, this blade may be aimed at your throat, for I am a dancer, a tool with more than one master, though you strike closer than any other of your kind, to the heart of it all. No, I can never be trusted. I nodded as the Elder raised its face to me, as if its neck did not even move. It continued. Then, while we walk the same path, I will be your first. My eyebrows furrowed as I looked quizzically at the solitaire. I know of your ways, Inquisitor. I am old, and I have known the Thaddeus and others of your ilk for some time now. You have no entourage, so I will be your first. I cannot swear to your cause, but I can swear to you. If you remember my warning, then, if you will have me, I am yours to command. My eyes fluttered in surprise, but I then nodded more sternly, a bargain made. Ask your questions. And so I sat, and we talked. Truly talked. We talked for hours, and I walked from that room changed. Not so dramatically as some of my other metamorphoses of late, but changed on a different level. My mind had been awoken by Thaddeus. My curiosity, caution, memory, perception, analysis, data recall. My psycho powers had erupted into being, then been more fully awoken by her, the sensei. But this? It hardened my heart. The tragedy of it. The simplicity. Of it. He told me all I wished to know, and what they say is right. They, the Eldar, feel emotions, factors, and intensities more than we do. Yet, merely watching one of their kind well up and lament, it is like a profound torture to see something so beautiful, then so wretched. To see something racked with such regret, turmoil, misery, and pain. To see it all expressed through word, dance, and dramatic music. This player performed his own fall. Just two and four. Me. 
and to survive this, for the performance was so powerful. I had to harden my heart, or it would have broken. Yet not once did I demur, not once did I switch to my witch sight to clear my empathy. I took it all, I absorbed it, every sensation, every word, jest, a sob and moan, every detail, trick, decision, position that he went through. But it was the simplicity of it, so staggering. And I now know one of the enemy better, the Prince of Pleasure. I know some of his moves, as some might put it. I felt like I had witnessed it all, and I was right there with him. I now understood why Thaddeus does what he does, how he endures the turmoil, how he always sees the bigger picture. It comes from one place. It is a wish to end the cycle. Not just do battle with evil, not just thwart its machinations, not just send it back to hell, but to defeat it finally and totally, to destroy it somehow. Because, after what I have heard, seen, felt, I will never forgive those utter. I will never ever drop my guard Ever. They must be stopped. They must be destroyed. Whew. I head to my quarters. I unlock the door and walk inside. I strip and get into bed, clasping the bolt pistol and combat knife below the sheets as usual. I put my head on the pillow and I will myself to sleep. After what I have witnessed, knowing full well what I may need to do in the coming days, let alone the coming decades, I will never know another night of clear dreams, of gentle rest again. So I will put my machine, my body, into its rest cycle. I will command my mind to restructure itself, to perform REM cycles, I will sleep the sleep of the just. For now, there can be no rest again. I may sleep, may recharge my body and mind, but my soul will never, ever rest until they are all destroyed. Never. Thaddeus 99, I know what is required of me. I understand now. I need no alarm. As scheduled, after eight full hours, my mind activates. I am aware of my breathing. The sheets are slick with sweat, something I expect to reduce in time. Then, perhaps I will need two stiff drinks before reclining, as does Darius. A concern for the future. I must be sharp. I must be inside the moment. I clothe and go to gain sustenance. I stand in queue for first meal, then instantly check myself. Breakfast. It is called breakfast. First meal was the way it was put on my home world, the contact with others from there. It haunts my subconscious, throws up old patterns again. I check myself. Again. Is this old patterns or external influence? But I admit that I was actually thinking of her. Funnily, this time it was not Ursula. She is called Santara, one of the girls I interrogated. Girls. <laughs> I remember now that she is older than me by two harvests. Years. She is older than me by two years. She had that gentle twang that they have in the south of our continent. Practically local. And she also liked the reeds and drums. It was only just becoming popular with most in the last years before. 
well. And I had tried it myself. I liked the uncontrolled energy of it all, but I was not musical. I had no drums, no reeds, and I could not sing. Hence, I just enjoyed it when they were playing. But she had been one of the first in the movement, so she told me, and her body language confirmed it. It was for this reason that she was to accompany the officials off-world, a minor rogue trader dynast. But of course, they did not make it to the ship before. This is weakness. Stop it. Before the skies bled, and the Neverborn flooded the world, and took whomever they wished as host, and slaughtered the rest. There. Done. I said it. Well, no more avoidance. I have daydreamed about her for a few, well, days now. It was puerile. It was wrong. She was under my care. Yet it was effectively harmless. As the old codger said, I hadn't had any shore leave in quite some time. So I fantasized for a few days. Kisses and cuddles, not the full shebang. Yet now, I am driven. I dispelled any thought of her, and I sat and ate my meal, and slowly gathered my mental strength. I saw some of the others in the hall. They witnessed my posture, poise, precision. They knew I was preparing. Well, all but one, perhaps. For Louis waddled over, and I thought that he would pass. But then he carefully placed his tray on my table. He slowly got into the chair across from me, and then straightened said tray and plate, and then just ate. He did not look at me. He did not gesture. He did not interact with me in any way or form. Yet somehow I could tell he was not ignoring me. And we ate together. I could concentrate. I could prepare. But I did not do it alone. When all was consumed, all drunk, we both looked up for the first time, and he just nodded at me, and then got down and waddled away, grinning mischievously, which, of course, was kind of funny, really because everyone knew exactly how much this annoyed the Astartes. Barbon would come in later on and go into a seething, quiet rage as he tidied up after the Jacaro. Everyone has their tics, their habits, and cleanliness was Barbon's thing. Well, more to say, order was his thing. So the fruit peels left outside his door, the plates and trays left in the middle of the floor or a table of the canteen, it made him cluck and tut like an old good wife when she could not scold an unruly child. And immediately, I was in higher spirits than I had any right to be. The incorrigible hairy orange weirdo. <laughs> but then I went to work. All preparations had been made by the crew in Devrin, or even by Barbon. The pens had been quiet as the grave after he was summoned to break up a seeming revolt. It was merely chanting and complaining, a bit of shouting. But when Barbon arrived, all fell silent. He drew no sword, shot no bolter. He just ran at them, stopped within a foot of their front rank. But to them, he might as well have teleported there. And they instantly broke and scattered. He had no helm on. He just glared down at them. And all has been quiet since. They even eat in silence. I then made sure that there was enough regulator in their meals to prevent agitation. But this had to be stopped for the next round of my inquiry. I needed them sharp, not merely so I could read them, see their minds more coherently, but also because, if they were sedated, then they had less chance of retaining self. 
they would be less likely to be burned by my moving inside their minds. And so, the very first one was brought in, tied to their chair far more tightly and comprehensively than before. And I did it. I extended my mind into his. There was no concerted effort to resist me, no training, almost no will. He was like an open book. But he was scared, and he was tired. So his mind was an open book whose pages turn in great sways, stopping on an image or memory, thought or feeling, for the briefest of moments, before the pages turned and we moved across his chronology again. And I attempted to calm him, to slip deeper into his brain and release some soothing chemicals. But I pushed too far too fast. My mind was like a burning torch amongst a cobweb framework of a near-broken man. And his mental lattice burned. His scheme was scrambled, his sense of self shattered. His screams pierced my ears. Then I attempted to leave him too swiftly. And his eyes, they burned out. He stank like a grox hit by lightning. His moan ended, as did his movement. I stood and walked to the door, the door to the outside, not to those watching, and I opened it and simply stated to the orderlies, Clear the room, then bring in the next one. I walked to the table and looked at the man the human I had slain. <sighs> he would get no apology. I then read the manifest to see who would be next. I would not make the same mistakes. I would learn from this. I would make no error twice. But I would not stop. Two days ago, if I had done this, I would have rushed to see Thaddeus. I would look into his eyes and hope to see it, understanding, forgiveness. But not any more. I witnessed the fall of an elder. I am Inquisitor Tarquinus. I am the understudy and chosen successor to the Thaddeus. I will find the truth of the situation, no matter the cost to me, for I am the servant of the Emperor. I am his hammer. To be continued.